am very happy to introduce you Dr. Chess from the Nassard Goddard Space Flight Center. He's a research astrophysicist and he's here to talk about the early universe. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. I got a chance to talk to some of you this morning and it's great to see th this enthusiasm and passion for exploration. It's, a, it's an enthusiasm and passion I, I of course, share. Um, we're both, I think we share a lot of passions in that we both believe very strongly in exploration of the universe. Um, the title of my talk is The Early Universe, but I want to use the early universe as basically a gateway to describe our current state of the art in terms of fundamental physics and cosmology. Um, it's a very timely topic in the sense that cosmology has actually c come into its own over the past 20 years or so, going from a very speculative science to one that's really backed up by a lot of data. We're making a lot of progress, but there still are a lot of questions out there, and I want to hit those in the talk and let you know what those questions are, along with sort of a, at least a brief roadmap as to where NASA, NASA and, the, and the rest of the scientific community is going in this, in this, in this field. Now, the idea, the, the desire to understand w where we came from is something that's really inherent to the human condition, as you all know. Um, long before science got into this game, artists, philosophers, theologians, and ordinary people would, you know, certainly wonder about where we came from. Um, I, I'm a father of small children, and, and seeing them grow up, they, they kind of come up with their own cosmologies as little kids, you know, to explain, to explain things that they don't understand about the world, and, it's, and it seems really innate to, to our, us as a species. This is one of my favorite pieces of art. This is the creation of Adam, which adorns the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in, in Rome, and it's, of course, the finger of God reaching out to the finger of Adam. I just, I just lo love this piece of art because it, it really does capture our, our um, desire to understand where we came from. Now, m moving on, science has actually gotten into this game much more recently, right? And I show here sort of a timeline or a, a, a string of how different sciences fit together. And really, there's, there's not, nature doesn't separate the world into different sciences, of course. Nature has one big thing that happened, and as human beings, um, who are interested in these things with limited resources and time, we, of course, break this up into different academic pursuits. And uh, I like this cartoon because it does, it does actually have a few um, pieces of truth to it. Um, we've got this sort of hierarchy of, of disciplines here, which, of course, all run together. Um, but the other thing about, and, of course, I like the self-deprecating uh, humor of the, the physicist being sort of the butt of the joke here. Um, but also, it's got a, it, it says something really intrinsic about the world, and this is something we've only discovered since applying science to, to our cosmology, right? And that, and that all, of, all of physics and, and science in, in general really does rely on math mathematics quite heavily, right? Mathematics seems to be the, the language of the universe. I had a quantum mechanics professor in graduate school who told me that, um, that for whatever reason it is, nature speaks to us in the language of mathematics, not music or something else. So it really is fundamental. And that being said, I'd like to just take a brief uh, diversion here before getting into the cosmology part of this talk. And, and in mathematics, we really do start with an accepted truth and then figure out what the consequences are, the non-obvious consequences of a statement or, or something we accept. Um, in cosmology, fundamental physics, and really all of science, we do the opposite, right? We start with the observation of the consequences and figure out the underlying truth. And of course, this, this, this requires us to have sort of a faith um, that there is an underlying truth out there, that the, that the universe intrinsically is comprehensible. And when I was growing up as a, as, a, as a teenager, on the wall of my room I had printed out this quote, which still really applies, and I think that's kind of cool. Um, and that Albert Einstein once said that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is in fact comprehensible. Uh, moving on to the thing that I, I'm most interested in comprehending, um, cosmology really teaches, really explores the big picture. What we're looking at here is what you get if you take the world's most powerful te telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, and point it at the darkest part of, part of the sky you can. This image is the Hubble Deep Field, and it's only about a tenth of a degree across, so close to 100 of these fit on the full moon. And what you're looking at, with the exception of this point, this point, and this point here, are all galaxies. So there's a lot of stuff out there. And the goal of cosmology, of course, is to answer questions like, what is all this stuff? How did it get here? And what's going to happen to it? So at this point, I'd really like to take a, a little bit of a historical um, uh, path 
and really describe kind of the road to where, how we got to where we are now um, in the field of cosmology. And I, I, I'm specifically talking about a physical cosmology here because I really want to start where science was able to pick up this story. Okay, the first, the start of this actually happened around the, the first century of the first millennia with Ptolemy. Now Ptolemy is remembered by most of us as sort of the, uh, the guy who lost, right? He was sort of the, the guy who got it wrong, right, in all of our history and science classes. Um, he basically said that, the, you know, of course, the Earth is the center of the, of the universe at that time. The solar system and the universe were kind of an interchangeable word, or interchangeable words at that point. But in fact, his idea here is actually a good one. Um, it fit the date of the time, and it took about 1,300 years for anyone to come up with data that would actually refute this. Of course, the person that ended up doing that was, was Copernicus, who, who replaced um, uh, the, the geocentric model with the heliocentric idea. And um, he basically said that, you know, the, 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 the Ptolemaic model of the of this Earth-centered universe it got too complicated. You had to put too many things in it to match the, the increasing number of observations. It's much simpler and works out better if you put the sun at the center. Um, for, for many years after this, they had to debate as to whether this was just a mathematical model or, or was it actually, did it represent a true reality? And of course, maybe that isn't that much of a distinction anymore in that mathematics um, plays a really key role in, in physical cosmology anyway. Okay, so just going through here, a couple of key um, advancements on the way to our, our current physical cosmology. Uh, Tycho Brahe was a Danish astronomer who was extremely good at making um, observations. So his, his big contribution was to supply a lot of data uh, from his naked eye observations in, and inject that into the scientific community, which his assistant, Johannes Kepler, was able to actually look for patterns in that data. Many of you are familiar, of course, Kepler's work. He came up with the with three laws of planetary motion. But it's, it's important to understand that these laws were actually phenomenological. They were based on they were basically patterns in empirical data. Right? There was no fundamental physical or mathematical law that they, they, they naturally derived from, which is, which is the goal of, of scientific theories, right? No one can talk about this without including Galileo. He's, uh, he's our, our good friend who, who, um, who uh, defended staunchly the Copernican theory of, of the sun-centered solar system. But he also was the first uh, real uh, famous experimental physicist. He was able to actually make laboratory measurements producing more, me more data, this time about, the, the dyna about dynamics, about motion, which, of course, Isaac Newton was summarily able to put into um, theories of gravitation, uh, comprehensive theories of gravitation and of, of motion. So by the end of the, by, by the mid-18th mid, um, century, uh, we had a mathematical theory of motion and gravity that seemed to work pretty well. And of course, these were being applied from everything to watchmaking to um, stellar, or to, to um, astronomical dynamics. Well, the plot actually thickens here in the 18th century with Charles Messier. Um, he, of course, as many of you know, uh, cataloged a whole bunch of sources that didn't look like stars. Right, and, and at this point they were able to, this was actually regarded as evidence for Immanuel Kant's um, island universes conjecture, which is basically that they've kind of figured out at this point that, that the, our solar system is probably one of many in our, in our Milky Way galaxy, and these things they're seeing are probably other things like us. And this was kind of a big step considering the technology at the time, and these guys were pretty big thinkers, right? So we're sitting there, so we're, we're sitting bef bef at, at, in the you know, end of the 18th century or so w with a pretty good understanding of what's going on, of course, every, you know, we had no idea of the Big Bang or anything like that at this point. There's one more thing that sort of paved the way for 20th century physics and, and the current cosmology that we're, we're setting up, and that is, of course, um, James Clerk Maxwell and others' work on electrodynamics. Um, this, this basically, in the mid-19th century, the, we, Maxwell was able to put together a theory in which four equations described basically all of the electromagnetic phenomena that we knew about. So this was basically the electromagnetic or electrodynamical analog to Newton's laws of motion in the, in the century before. And the, the takeaway from this basically is that we discovered, there was discovered that light is in fact an electromagnetic wave and the speed of light is finite. Um, the important thing to know about this, to, to point, at this point, to point out about this though is that this theory is inconsistent with Newton's theory. Right? And this paved the way for, of course, the 20th century of physics. Okay, the, th the, the key theory that underlies modern cosmology is Einstein's theory of general relativity. And of course, this is a, an, an interpreta a new interpretation of gravity and motion 
that, it, that it is consistent with Maxwell's equations, and, and Newton's laws were shown to be a subset of this that work in very specific, um, albeit uh, common, circumstances. And the basic idea here is that space and time are relative. Um, they depend on the, the observer and the event, and that gravity is actually defined ge is, is actually a geometric phenomenon in which, as um, one famous physicist put it, uh, mass and energy tell space-time how to curve, and space-time tells matter and energy how to move. Well, soon after Einstein came up with this theory, um, it was applied to the universe as a whole. And to do this, you make the very general assumption that the universe on large scales is both homogeneous, it's the same everywhere, and isotropic, same in every direction. Right, so this is actually applied to Einstein's field equation, which is a, and this is basically, this equation here is basically everything there is of general relativity. The details are sort of, of course, hidden from view here. Um, on the left-hand term has, is a term that basically has to do with the geometry of space-time. The right-hand term has a couple of constants, and then this term that has to do with the, uh, the matter and energy content of the universe. And all Einstein's theory says is that those two are equal. So they're, they're dynamical entities that play off against one another. Well, these two guys, um, this is a sort of a history including a lot of smart guys here, right? Um, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre discovered that when you apply this equation with, those, with the Copernican principle, you find a solution for an expanding universe or a contracting universe. But you don't f the key here, though, is that you don't find one for a static universe. So this idea of these island universes just sitting out there can't happen, according to Einstein's theory of relativity. And of course, whenever anyone discovers something like this in science, there's a lot of turmoil and what well, was the theory wrong and all this kind of stuff, right? And Einstein said, yes, absolutely, the theory is wrong. We have to correct it because there's no way the universe is expanding or contracting. It's staying constant. And so he plugs the, he fixes the equation with a, with a cosmological constant term here, and everything's fine again. The universe is static. Until 1929, when Edwin Hubble discovers, of course, that the universe is expanding. And he did this in a very clever way, and this sort of shows the evolution of astronomy. We went from, you know, the, the 19th century with, with Charles Messier kind of making sketches of things, but now with photographic plates and, and, and measurement tools, um, he was actually able to measure the distance of objects relative to their velocity and found that the further away you went, the further something was receding away. And so he discovered this very nice law that the recession velocity is actually equal to the Hubble constant, and he didn't actually name the Hubble constant, somebody else did, um, times the distance. So the further something is away, the faster it's moving away from us. This is exactly what you'd actually expect from an expanding universe. Um, and this is a sort of a brief demonstration here, and I apologize for the crudeness of this. There's probably a better way to do it now with technology. Um, if you take a look at, so I'm going to expand the universe to twice its scale, and these are sort of representative of galaxies along a line here. If you look at the center one, um, compared to the one that's one unit away now, and compared to the one that's two units away now, you'll see that as we expand the universe, the closer one is now two units away, so it moved one unit in the amount of time it took to expand the universe. This guy is now four units away, so that moved two units away. Right, so the further something is away, the faster it's receding from whatever, any given object. And it doesn't take too much imagination to, to move your reference point to any one of these objects in the, in the, um, in the grid here and find that everything's hap that's happening to each object individually. Right, so so there's the fact that everything's moving away from us does not indicate that we have some special location in space. Everyone sees that in the expanding universe. So we come back to Einstein here. And Einstein says basically, sorry, my bad. Um, and says, this is my greatest blunder, I'm sorry, ignore it, of course the universe is expanding. So it's kind of interesting that Einstein's, Einstein's theory predicted something that Einstein didn't really like, but it ended up being true. <laughs> so it, in fact, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a spoiler here, in that, that we will see the cosmological constant emerge again, um, but in a different concept that Einstein didn't imagine. But again, it's sort of, um, he was a particularly great mind and, and ended up uh, doing lots of stuff that maybe he didn't intend to do. <laughs> okay, so. Well, now we've got a cosmology, we've got an expanding universe, we have equations that can describe this. And I want to kind of talk a little bit about kind of the where cosmology was in maybe 1995, right? We're, we're jumping forward a little bit. This is when I started graduate school, this is the debate people were having. And it turns out that if you make the assumptions of isotropy and homogeneity, the cosmological principle, that there's only three real possibilities of the shape of the universe. And this is, this, we're talking about the intrinsic curvature of the universe. And I'm going to talk first about the right-hand part of this, this slide here. And you have to remember, we're talking